Hi, welcome to Clock Talk. I'm Crystal here on Think Tech on this Tuesday morning. So we're going to talk about LGBTQ issues today. Now, on one hand, there's been a kind of a nice wave of support and inclusiveness for this issue, particularly in the US, I guess. But in Asia, there are places that are having pushback, and there's just a lot of complications. This is a complex kind of a rise and suppression of this issue. And why is that? And so today we're going to talk about the kind of impact and how the LGBT community is in Asia and how that impacts Asian Americans. It's an interesting bridge because we don't really talk about that crossover, in fact, is very connected. So I have a brilliant uh, honorary guest today with us, Justice McKenna. And first of all, if you don't know, Justice McKenna is well, born and raised in Japan and the Philippines, but more importantly is the Justice of the Supreme Court here in Hawaii. So we're very, very honored to have her here. Um, and an advocate and a champion of women's uh, rights and women's representation in, in the legal um, industry. So without further ado, let me introduce Justice McKenna. Welcome, Sabrina. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for having Thank me. Thank you. Now, um, first I want to talk about your identity as an, you know, do you identify as Asian American or because you were born in Asia, and mm -hmm. yet you've lived here for so long. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's a very blurry identity issue. Right. Well, I grew up in Japan and the Philippines. I attended, my father was American, my mom was uh, Japan-Japanese, right. who became naturalized. So, but I attended U.S. military DOD schools in Japan and the Philippines. So I do identify as an Asian American, especially, I think, since my dad died when I was a kid. And uh -huh. I was raised by my mom, and so right. we spoke Japanese at home. Ah. And I came to UH undergrad. I do identify as Asian American. That's, That's why I often include Shizue in my name. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's uh -huh. a, okay. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, being here in Hawaii where it's so Asian American, people don't think about the connections we have to Asia in a deep sense yes. and how that impacts kind of our value system. Yes. So when it comes to LGBT issues, there's a really interesting, you know, ways, like with a conservative traditional aspect as opposed to today's modern kind of trends. Now, let's just break it up a little bit. I did a little research. Um, in the US, apparently, the LGBT community kind of uh, trends um, or kind of people who've come out openly have increased. Yes. I think the last year has been like up by 4.5%, which is uh, unusually high compared to the last few consecutive years. Well, that's interesting. I wasn't aware of that statistic, but that makes sense, I think, especially since uh, the laws have started to change. I've always said that it takes legal change for people to be able to come out. I didn't really come out until after um, 1991 when Hawaii uh, abolished employment discrimination and sexual orientation. And then I could, knew that I could be safe coming out. But uh, up until then, people could be fired for being gay, right? right? So you don't want to come out if you're going to lose the roof over your head. But what was the pivotal uh, kind of catalyst in 1991, in, uh, other than the legal aspect? Sure. Well. Um, it was the law, and then I decided, at that point, I was leaving the Japanese company that I was working for, okay. and I decided I wanted to go into public service, and at that point, I wanted to be a judge, uh, but I didn't get the judgeship, but I got to be a, uh, a position as assistant professor at the law school. Uh -huh. So I was entering into public service in the government sector, in the legal arena. I did become a judge in 1993, but I knew that the law would protect me at that point, and I knew that the law school and the judiciary which in 1993, the Bayer versus Lewin case, the first court in the world to say that denial of same-sex marriage could be unconstitutional, huh. um, that case just really is strength of my resolve to try to become a judge. And I just realized that uh, the judiciary of the state of Hawaii would be very, very protective and um, respective of And they uh, were. I, clearly. You didn't find any kind of pressures or even no no not in terms of uh, my uh, being appointed or just a supervision or anything like that you know just as in any other place you're going to hear a few comments here and there but when uh, those issues are brought to uh, administrators attention it's you know uh, there was a it was ad addressed immediately and why we've for years now we've had a bias and prevention and harassment guide which clearly prohibits, um, and all employees are trained, of course, judges, but all employees and staff mm -hmm. are also trained on not allowing any type of bias or harassment uh, based on all categories, including sexual orientation and gender identity. But the problem is, as much as the law protects, 
you can't control the way people act right outside. Right, right. And so um, many families who, you know, even if they live in the States, they don't realize kind of the impact of maybe their uh, traditional family, whether it's a religious aspect or the, the ethnic aspect, that's right. kind of influenced the way they're controlled or suppressed in, in coming out or actually coming to terms with who they are. Right. Um, yeah. it, it's like, how much can they all really ultimately I mean, I guess, right. you know what I'm saying? Yes, exactly. It basically gets down to the personal level. It's family that is most important. And unfortunately, I have found that it seems like based on some of the Asian influences here, not necessarily the Pacific Island influences, because I think the Pacific Island countries, and than. actually some of the Asian countries were traditionally very accepted of LGBT or, you know, especially uh, transgender or different types of gender identity. Uh, but uh, because of the more conservative, tr conservative trends in the last couple yes. hundred years and people coming to Hawaii from Asia and those countries, the home countries, still being pretty um, uh, discriminatory, I, I think it has become, in some ways, I think Hawaii, despite its liberal views and laws, a lot of people still don't come out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk about um, some specific kind of extreme uh, cases in Asia where, I mean, in the last few years, there have been increasing flows of kind of inclusivity in terms of opening up to same-sex marriage. Um, but let's talk about Brunei, which is shockingly, horrifyingly. Um, I talked about this with my daughter in the car as I drove to her school today. She's like, how is this possible? Do you care to, maybe for people who don't know, the new regulation in Brunei against um, same-sex? Right. So uh, homosexual sex and adultery is punishable with uh, death by stoning now in Brunei. That's Middle Ages. Um, yes. Well, uh, yeah, I, I think so. Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, I try to keep an open mind in the sense that there are many countries that think that the America is uh, still very uh, regressive because we still have capital punishment, where a lot of advanced nations don't. Good point. Right? Yeah. So. Wow. Okay, but that's still shocking. You know, it's still kind of creating many, many ripples in the LGBTQ yes. community. Yes. Um, it's just unfathomable to to think that you could um, die because of your your just preference in gender. Right. Um, but do you want to kind of touch on the different um, other Asian countries, kind of sure. in relation to that? Sure. So in general, you know. Um, and I have to tell you that I'm not an absolute specialist, but I do follow some of these issues. Yeah. You know, 26 countries now allow same-sex marriage, and that was the conversation started with the Hawaii Supreme Court. Mm. And of course, you know, there was a fight until 2015, and the United States Supreme Court has now held that uh, denial of same-sex marriage is a violation of federal constitutional rights. So that is the law of the land in the United States now. And you know, before that, some Western European nations, and now 26 countries, but none in Asia. Now, in the Pacific, we have Australia and New Zealand that now allow same-sex marriage, mm -hmm. um, but there are no Asian countries that permit uh, same-sex marriage yet. Wow. Mm -hmm. But there are some places that don't have legal ramifications of it, but then there's this social pressure. So there's kind of like an indirect way of controlling the population. Right, 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 right. Like, so, you know, I, recently, in the last couple of years, I've been to Japan, Hong Kong, yes. and most recently, India, to talk about some of these issues. Um, and finally, India, the India Supreme Court, it's only September of 2018. That's right that they abolished uh, Section 377. The India Supreme Court ruled Section 377 of their penal code unconstitutional. And this was one of those vestiges of British colonialism th ah. that was in their law that basically criminalized homosexual ac activity. Um, and you know, when you think about it, it was only 2003 that the United States Supreme Court in Texas versus Lawrence, the Texas law was finally ruled unconstitutional. Wow. The United States Supreme Court had upheld a sodomy law in Bowers versus Hardick in 1986. And so wow. therefore, you know, it, it's still, it's not, it's, it's kind very, of recent history. Yes. Hawaii, in its wisdom, abolished our law, I believe, in 1972. Uh, I, Hawaii tends to be a little bit more enlightened. You know, we abolished capital punishment in 1941. So um, Hawaii is much more protective of civil rights. But yeah, it's 2018. India finally said this is, it's unconstitutional. 
people cannot come out if if it's a crime, right? right? But how uh, long did the, they advocate for this? Cash? Oh, many years. And in fact, in 2009, the Delhi High Court had, that's like the Delhi Supreme Court of the state of Delhi, uh -huh. had ruled that it was unconstitutional, but the uh, India Supreme Court overturned that in 2014. Oh. And then there was, you know, all this movement by additional um, uh, politicians and uh, legal advocates to have the India Supreme Court reconsider that 2014 decision. And finally, in September 2018, it was overturned. Okay, so that's uh, a huge deal. It was a huge deal. But now you were there also on behalf of the East West Center to do a talk, and you mentioned something about how they needed to have more women representing the justice system. Yes. And do you think that that's kind of a big part of why the regulations are the way they are now, with the lack of Well, women? I, you know, I have always said that um, increasing the number of women within the judiciary and mm -hmm. leadership does lead to greater justice. I believe so because I think all women, I think all women have experienced some level of sexual discrimination yeah. or sexual harassment. Right. And so we can, we start from the perspective we understand discrimination. And I think, you know, as a feminist, and I think feminists in general, it's not just about promoting women, it's about creating equal rights for all. Mm. And so I think having women within the judiciary really, really does change perspectives. I think that, you know, it was after 1972 and Patsy Mink's Title mm. IX law where, where the significant increase in women in the judiciary, women lawyers, women in law schools, then women in the judiciary, I think attitudes toward domestic violence laws changed, sexual assault laws changed in the United States, and that's something that I'm saying in right. India. I was actually invited by a law school, ah. Jindal Global Law School, um, which, with which uh, UH does have a sister relationship. Okay. And we actually accept uh, summer volunteers from externs oh, nice. from that uh, law school in the summer. Because it's, it's a, you know, India is an English common law system. Right. Their education at that level is all in English. So they can actually, they don't have a language barrier. Right, right. Yeah. There's no excuse for that. But at the same time, it's a very deeply rooted kind of traditional male-dominated exactly. culture. Yeah, exactly. And there's so few women. And it was interesting because I was interviewed by the news um, agency representative, a wonderful person, very, I think, very open-minded and enlightened person. Um, but he was, you know, saying, we now have three women out of 31 <laughs> in the Supreme Court. And, I, and we only had one last year. And I was like, that's tokenism. You uh. know, three out of 31 is tokenism. And it's real. There's very few women in the high courts, which is like the state supreme courts. Right. Very few women. And I said, you know, really, you need to have a system. So, and how did they react to that? Like, um, were they uh, well, respectful of that? I think I was talking to the men, and I was right. talking to some of the male Supreme Court justices, and they said, I think the ones that I'm talking to are the enlightened ones. Okay. So <laughs> that's true. Um, so yes. it depends on your kind of how exactly. you spoke to the really. Yeah, um, chauvinistic ones. Oh, yeah. that'd be interesting. I'm not sure how, how that would cut. But yeah, yeah I, I have I have hope for change. You know, I'm very grateful for change. And I went to several law schools, and there were many women law students, and they're so bright and so driven. And you know, I just have great hope for the future of India. And of course, Japan, my home country. I've gone. I spoke at the Gender and Law Society for the first time a couple years ago. They dedicated a conference to sexuality, gender. Um, sexual orientation and gender identity issues. Oh, and that time, you know, I, I was open about my own sexuality, and it was amazing because after I spoke, several people, several of the professors got up and they came out. Oh, wow. And, and people around me are like, oh my God. See, it takes somebody like yeah. you to open up, and then people kind of trickle in and Right, people share. start opening up, yeah. you know. And, and of course, Japan, uh, Japan doesn't have specific laws. Uh, criminalized. It was only, I think, like from 18, in the 1800s for about eight years when Japan, uh, they did have some laws criminalizing homosexual conduct, but that's not Japanese right. culture right. either. Exactly. So going back the to the culture, culture versus, versus, yeah. the samurai so culture, the monk culture, <laughs> male society. Exactly. Well, let's take a quick break and come back. This, this is a very juicy topic, and there are so many issues with different specific Asian countries, let alone the gender categorization that we're talking about. So don't go away. We're going to talk to Justice McKenna more on the LGBT issues in Asia and its impact on Asia American, which we'll, we will come back to shortly. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. 
I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that you know may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. Back here on Quok Talk, I'm Crystal talking to Justice McKenna about LGBT issues in Asia and beyond, and in Hawaii, and the impact. I mean, we're all global citizens, so how does it impact us? And what if you're a transnational and you're connected to both sides? Aha, uh -huh, that's where we are, too. So back here uh, in the studio. Now, um, Sabrina, you talked about the kind of the impact in Japan, even, and the kind of the increasing um, uh, support and embracing uh, of these issues. Now, just to give a little rough idea for some people is that I, according to a survey I saw, um, Philippines tends to be the most gay-friendly accepted place out of Asian countries, okay? This is according to the survey from last year. 73% uh, agree that homosexuality should be accepted. 54% um, in Japan, 39 in South Korea. Those are just a few broad numbers. Right. Um, right. Then we've got Brunei, right. we just mentioned earlier. Right. And Singapore, where same-sex, um, Sexual activity is, of course, illegal, up to two years in prison. Um, some are more blurry. Malaysia is interesting. It, well, that was more specific. It, said, it actually said that anal and oral sex was up to 20 years of punishment. Wow. Wow. And, and how do they prove that? You know, right, it's right, all these right, kind right, of... Right, 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 how do, right. so, so on the legal aspect, yes, 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 yes. how does this kind of like very personal relationship activity get translated into the law? Well, that's, that's very interesting. You know, I, candidly, I don't know how the, the extent of privacy laws in those countries. In the United States, it would be hard for police to just break into a home to see if right. a conduct was taking place. I really don't know what the laws are in those countries in terms of protection of uh, privacy issues. But it is disturbing. Um, but, you know, you said of the Philippines. Yeah. Um, there was a 2013 um, study that also showed the broad support within the Philippines. But what, what I was really heartened is the same as in the United States. When you looked at, uh, for, for example, in Japan, all the, uh, the support for people under the age of 30 for same-sex marriage and LGBT rights was like, 80 percent. Mm. It was the older people. Yes, yes. And so it's the, I think it's internationally, globally, the trend is the younger people, especially Absolutely. with social media and awareness. Yeah. It is getting better and better. But is yeah. it though? Is, I was going to ask you, does social media kind of aid in the uh, inclusiveness of it or does it actually stir people who are kind of like trying to draw old things? Because you look at like terrorism, Right. Social media is a platform for also enabling that. Right, 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 right. And, you know, um, one of the things, I also attended a media conference in India on social media uh -huh. in, in terms of the effect of the elections, but they also talked about the impact of people having all these WhatsApp groups. WhatsApp is the number one social media in India, and they're uh -huh. forwarding things through WhatsApp, false things too, like this oh. person ate beef. So a mob comes and lynches and beats and kills uh -huh. them. You know, things like that, okay, too. So, yeah. yeah, social media, you're right. It, it cuts both ways. It can yeah. be, uh, but it, it, it increases exposure. Mm -hmm. So people can find resources much easier, right? The right. young people, if they have a smartphone, not everybody has a smartphone, yeah. right? But they can access information yeah. at least and get some comfort from that, even if they don't feel like they can come out themselves. Right. You know, and people okay. in India still are not really coming out. No, uh, sure. And even in Japan, people are not it's still a long really way to go, coming yeah. out. There are some movements. There are some cities uh, or wards within Tokyo that are now allowing same-sex uh -huh. partnerships. Tokyo Metropolitan Government just passed a law to not allow LGBT and LGBT discrimination in the workplace. The Tokyo Metropolitan Government okay, good. just this month. 
Yeah, I think it just went into effect April 2019. Okay, so this so, will impact the younger generation more. Yes, so yes. So things are opening up. There's still more movements. There's a bunch of cities that are now yeah. allowing, and then some like public housing, depending on the city, is allowing same-sex right. couples. But still in terms of no, yeah. because the Constitution says uh, the consent of both sexes is the way it's interpreted, you'll see. Right. And so that's how it's interpreted. There may be, a, I think there's some, Points of view that a constitutional yeah. amendment may be necessary in Japan to allow same-sex marriage, but we'll see. But I think, okay, so that's the legal aspect. And uh -huh. then going back to the personal, I feel like, um, again, reading on some issues with Asians, um, it's not just the gender issue. They've mm -hmm. got family pressures because mm -hmm. of the religious uh, background, right. the, the ethnic, the cultural right. kind of traditional right. ways of being. Right. And so, in fact, I kind of wrote down, it's really quite sweet. In, in India, this one guy said, India should create a space where I'd actually be able to make my family understand that it's normal. Right, 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 right. And that's why, you know, when I go to India and I speak, I'm very open. I, I say I am the first Asian Pacific American uh, state Supreme Court justice, an open member of the LGBT community. And the reason I came out and the reason I, you know, I'm not an LGBT rights specialist, but of course I care about these issues. And if I, and I care about civil rights issues. And when I'm in these Asian countries, I'm going to talk about it. And I, I talk about myself because I think it's important for people mm -hmm. to see, the, you know, the Asians in those countries to right. say, hey, wait a minute. Oh. Yeah. You know, I guess you can actually have a life, you know, uh, and be LGBTQ. So, but in any event, um, the reason that I came out really is because my last position before I got this one in 2011 was to head the family court in Kapolei. And there I learned some terrible statistics. I know you're aware of some of these statistics, but, you know, LGBTQ youth are four times as likely to attempt suicide. Yeah. If you, LGBTQ youth, from families that reject them mm. are eight times as likely to attempt suicide yes. than LGBTQ youth that come from families that accept them. So it's a family thing. Yeah. And then the most disturbing one to me was although, and this is an older study, but 80% of Caucasian youth came out to their youth, came out to their parents. It was 71% for Latinos, 61% for African Americans. Okay. And it was only 51% for Asian Pacific American youth in Japan, that, uh, in the United States, that come out to their parents. This is an older study. But, you know, it's, but it's because the Asian the families, yes. It's the Asian, and, yeah. then, and then you relate that to the statistics about suicide, you, you yeah. worry. And it's very disheartening because I have, uh, there is this one uh, organization, NGO, called Rainbow 808 here, uh -huh. and they do support a lot of youths, in, um, homeless youth, yes. and a lot of them are because of the LGBT issues right. that they were kicked out of the home, and it's really, 40% really of the homeless youth are LGBTQ. Yeah, yeah and people but don't realize people the impact. People their kids out of homes. And then the psychological aspect. I mean, we can talk on forever about right, this, but right. I'll try to draw it back, but I feel like, People don't see the impact. Right. Because they're just kind of like swept aside. Right. And this is why we need to talk about this. Yes. But going back to the transnational aspects too. I mean, so going back into Asians particularly, how they're impacted. Um, we mentioned family. Um, and then there's cause some, some Asians criticize a lack of visibility. So it doesn't encourage them to come out. Right. You know, right, like right, look right, at right. media representation. Right. I don't know, Hollywood, media, right. all that. Right, so right, right, right. So how does that have to change also in order to kind of make it? But is it something that we should make normal? Like that's, that's a question, right? right? People are criticizing that movement. Right, exactly. And then, you know, in, two, in 2011 when I came out and I was appointed, you know, publicly, and I was appointed to this, when I was appointed to this position, I said, you know, I do hope that we come to a time that we don't have to say, oh, she is the first, you right. know, and, but unfortunately, we're still there in certain aspects, you know, we need the first to come okay. out, so the seconds and the thirds, and then the masses can start coming out. If you look at the statistics, up to 10% of the entire world population is probably LGBTQ, right? Because B is included, right? And so, right. so um, right. you know, there's so many people, if more people would come out. While I was in India, I met uh, a woman who is a CEO, an Indian woman who uh -huh. is an out lesbian. And she is, I think she's going to help change the things. And there was okay. another uh, gay uh, uh, male CEO. Yeah. Uh, and I, it's, we need more and more people coming out. Um, but do you yeah. see all that kind of pushback um, within the kind of the majority dominant structure where they feel like, I mean, their, their justifying of this is that this is against what normal 
Right, is. and that's what I keep saying when I'm in <laughs> India, and I'm not an expert on him. But when you look back at the Hindu and the traditional texts, mm. oh my God, this was all celebrated and transgender, yeah. you know, yeah. God's changing gender. <laughs> and of course, India is progressive in terms of the th what they call the third gender, the hijira. The uh, this uh, India Supreme Court in 2013 recognized the third gender, mm. right? But traditional Asian cultures were like that too. There were. You know, Indonesia, I understand, had like five cultures. But people tell me, and I don't know if this is true, but it really was the traditional cultures were much more open. But when the Mughal Empire, which was the uh, Muslim Empire, they had much more uh, conservative laws. Uh -huh. And then India was um, colonized by Britain, which had very conservative right. laws. So now, it, you know, I'm hoping India goes back to its traditions of celebrating diversity. Yeah. Because that is the traditional diversity of India. Just like, you know, I think that spread to the South Pacific, um, you know, the Hawaiian cultures. Right. The, the so Samoan, why has Hawaiian but, culture been so, uh, or actually island Pacific? Pacific I think Islanders. it's why religious. It so I open? think it's, well, because in terms of the openness, it's because Traditionally, it's been natural. It's been natural. It was accepted. Mm. I think that the repression came more from foreign religions yes. coming in and uh, imposing their values. So, are we? Can we assume safe to assume that religion is kind of the root of this whole kind of reversal of our openness? Well, I'm. I'm. I'm, I'm, to, I'm not going to comment on that. Um, I, but you know, I think. I think it would be. It would, you have to recognize the impact yeah. of religious yeah. beliefs, yeah. But I, I think, think and then going forward, I mean, we in this short, limited time left on the show, um, what would you say to people who don't really understand why they should accept and include, uh, include LGBT community as a part of naturalness? Well, you know, just if you go, uh, my daughter uh, w was taking a course on sexuality at Boston University, and she's like, Mom, my God, in nature, animals, plants, um, nature, uh, LGBT yeah, appears in nature. This is a natural phenomenon. And so I think people need to stop saying that this is unnatural right. because this does, it's been there forever. Exactly. And, you know, you can't just repress uh, all these people in the population. I just, I really want to encourage the parents to accept yes. their kids. Yes. That's the most important thing. Thank you for saying that. Yes. I really appreciate that. And before we go to, I wanted to do a shout out for our event at the East West Center's uh, International Women's Group tomorrow evening at Holly Halavai. Um, Justice McKenna is going to be leading a discussion on gender, uh, justice, and civil rights. So yes. we can continue this conversation over because it's all relevant. So thank you so much for coming and sharing all your personal and valued views from the justice system and uh, really appreciate this. Thanks so much. Thank Crystal. you. We need Thank to talk so more. Much for having so family, me. listen and include. Thank you.